Hey, this is Dr. Evan Osar with Fitness Education Seminars. Welcome to this edition of Fitness Insider. Today we're going to talk about fitness and fascia, what you need to know, and this is a part one of three tutorials I've put together for you. So I hope you enjoy it, and let's get started. Part one, why the sudden focus on fascia? It's everywhere these days, literally and figuratively. It's found everywhere in our body. It surrounds and invents itself in muscles, tendons, bones, joints, including the joint ligaments and the capsules, nerves, organs, and blood vessels. Fascia and functional exercise. We've always trained fascia, we just never really thought of it that way. For example, look at the picture of the cable chest press. We're training the anterior oblique chain, which includes the rhomboids, the serratus, the external oblique, the abdominal fascia, the contralateral internal oblique, adductor, and down the fascia line to the leg, lower leg and foot. So we've always trained it, we just never really thought of training fascia lines. So we're gonna look at fascia and function in its role as support, in its role as a sensory organ, in its role as a contractile, part of the contractile system. Number one, support. As we said, fascia surrounds all our tissues. It's thickened in areas under high load, as in the IT band, the plantar fascia, the thoracolumbar fascia, and the right inoculum of the wrist and the ankle. It basically works as a fascial envelope. Basically, our muscles are contained within the fascia, and when the muscles contract it, as for example, in running and single leg support, the vastus lateralis contracts and pushes out into the iliotibial band, making the knee very stable and making the entire lower extremity a stable structure to support three to five times our body weight when walking and even more when we're running. So again, we get gain fascial support. And again, the muscles contract into the fascial envelope. And this image is coming out of my new book, which should be out hopefully this year the integrated movement solution to common hip and shoulder dysfunction. Number two, sensory organ. Fascial mechanoreceptors include Piscini and Pisciniform, Ruffini type two, interstitial type three and four, and Golgi type one B. Again, those are just big fancy words for saying fascia is a sensory organ. All these mechanoreceptors, their role is not only to control and work as part of the contractile system, but also to sense and give feedback to the central nervous system about where the body is in space. So a lot of our clients with these chronic postural dysfunctions will have this function of their fascial system and often we have to address the fascial system in order to correct these postural dysfunctions. Number three, contractile system. Muscles contain, or I'm sorry, fascia contains myofibroblasts and are stimulated by mechanical tension, stretch, or use. They're innervated by alpha smooth muscle actin and it, which enables prolonged contraction with very little energy expenditure. So again, when our fascial system is functioning normal, we can sustain posture with very little effort, which is what we want. You know your clients that you see them that when they have poor posture, they're working really hard to move the body. They're working really hard just to hold the body in place. That's why clients get so fatigued so easily through exercise, and that's why so many clients have to resort to things like caffeine and other stimulus to get them more energized because they're not sleeping well and their fascial system and their muscular system is working so over time to create support. So fascia also works as a functional conduit. So muscles are attached to tendons, tendons to ligaments, ligaments to joint capsules, and which attaches to other ligaments on the other side of the joint, to tendons, to muscles. So what connects all these things? You got it, fascia. Fascia connects and intertwines the musculoskeletal system and we might as well just include the neuromyofascial ligamentous system and creates these long chains of functional muscles. So muscles really don't work in isolation. They work as part of a long chain within the body. Force, so how does soft tissue force affect fascia? Well, we can affect it mechanically, as in cross friction or myofascial release techniques. We can use holding techniques, which we'll talk about, and we can also do it through joint manipulation. So cross friction. So cross friction was first documented used by George Goodhart in 1964, developer of the first origin insertion technique through the system applied kinesiology. And basically, basically what George Goodhart did was he cross frictioned the origin insertion of a weak muscle, and then when he retested it, tested strong. So how did that work? Well, supposedly it increases the activity in the myofibroblast, causing fascial stiffness. So anytime you stimulate a muscle and you do rigorous, rapid, and or even slightly uncomfortable cross friction of the joint or a muscle that crosses a joint, we get increased fascial stiffness, which gives us better support. 
And again, it probably increases nociception, which increases the sympathetic nervous system, which also helps to support. Mechanical te techniques like myofascial release, as in manual therapy, foam rolling, balls and sticks, can also help distract and move fascia. So again, if you don't do soft tissue techniques and you know clients have fascial dysfunction, we know that foam rolling and using different things like balls and sticks will help manipulate and move fascia. Holding techniques is sort of a newer area that's gaining recognition, but it's always been around. And Burrell, Barnes, and Giamato are several of the leading pioneers in this type of work, and they utilize light and sustained holds. So they'll grab a body part or an area of fascial restriction and hold it until it releases it. And there's many different ways to do that with holding techniques. So how can, it, how can this work and why and how can it be effective for our clients? Well, really, the most important thing is it decreases the sympathetic tone and increases parasympathetic tone. If we have a client that comes in and they're revved up, they're type A personality, they're going, they're on caffeine, they're not sleeping well, their sympathetic nervous system and their increased tone in their body is out of control. If we want to put new good information into the central nervous system, we have to decrease the sympathetic tone and increase how much the parasympathetic system is functioning. That's why we'll use holding techniques in our office and why we'll, I'll show you another technique to do this exact same thing. Again, and this is to, to induce relaxation so that we can input new good information. Joint manipulation. This has been used for chiropractors and body workers for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. And basically we're referring to high velocity, low amplitude. So like what we do in the chiropractic office. What does this do? It creates global inhibition of sympathetic activity. And that's why so many clients feel so much more relaxed after a chiropractic manipulation. So it's another way to affect the nervous system through the joints and the fascial system. So what if you don't do soft tissue work? Then just take a breath. As I said, breathing is one of the most effective things that you can do to decrease sympathetic nervous system activity and improve parasympathetic nervous system activity. When we test clients and they test weak or inhibited, one of the easiest things we can do to get them started before a session is activate them through proper diaphragmatic breathing and core activation. You can see this client in this picture has her chest and rib cage in an awesome position lined up with her pelvis. Her neck is in deep neck flexion to activate the deep neck flexors. So therefore we get centration of her hip, knee, ankle, centration of her entire spine, which will start to activate the global structures of the trunk and spine to help get her connected and aligned before we start to train with her. So functional application. Clients that are sympathetic dominant, dominant, use a holding technique or joint manipulation. And if you don't work with somebody or, or if you don't do that technique yourself, then find somebody that can help you and do those techniques on your client because it'll really make everything you do with your client much more effective. Client that has muscle inhibition or joint laxity, you can use a cross friction technique. And again, if you don't use that technique or do soft tissue techniques, find somebody that can help you with that because again, you can really help improve joint stabilization if the muscles are activated around the joint and you can then train them in centrated positions. Best approach, combination of both the above approaches. So again, you want to activate where they're sort of shut down and you want to calm down their system before you start. And again, you can create a lot of powerful changes just by having clients breathe right. So summer, fascia is ubiquitous. It's everywhere in our bodies. We can't get away from it. Fascia contracts and functions as a proprioceptive organ. It helps us detect where our body is in space and it helps hold our body in space with less muscular effort. Fascia can be affected by soft tissue and joint specific techniques. And again, don't forget about breathing. It's so powerful, you should do it before every single session with your client, just to get them connected, aligned, and ready to receive new information. So next time, in part two of this tutorial, we'll look at what affects fascia, what happens when things go wrong with fascia, and what does fascial dysfunction look like? Because again, if we understand fascia and we know what goes wrong with it, then we can have a nice plan of what to do to get people functioning better and more optimal and get them achieving their functional goals. So I hope you enjoyed this part one of fascia and fitness. Look forward to seeing you in part two. Have a great day and we'll catch you next time. This is Dr. Evan Osar with Fitness Insider and Fitness Education Seminars. Bye-bye.